Dear colleagues and friends, welcome to the second webinar of uh, this module. Today, we have the great pleasure of having Professor Linda De Vries as speaker, and she will tell us, she will tell us about the long-term outcome in hypoxia, ischemic encephalopathy. And I think that Linda is a, a true authority in this field. And uh, yeah. I am so pleased to point out that uh, together with Professor Ramengi, <laughs> Linda organized the entire Web's pro brain program. So I leave, I leave to Luca. I leave to Luca the pleasure of uh, introducing Linda. Please, Luca. Thank you, Corrado. Uh, it is honestly uh, a real honor, also together with the pleasure to to introduce Linda De Vries. Uh, I've been knowing uh, Linda since ages. She has been a guide since ever. She's produced many papers. She's produced many chapters of books and fantastic talks, uh, always uh, forwarded in the sense that uh, anticipating things that became real. So, so this is the main sense. And uh, just to, to make it, to have a bit of fun, I will never forget the first time I asked her a question is exactly 30 years ago, 1992. It was in Assisi, San Francisco area. And I was very proud to have uh, discovered something. And I said, well, I've got five patients presenting in the next abstract uh, European Society of Pediatric Research, uh, showing that uh, small cysts below the frontal horns, anterior horns of the ventricles, they are not perventricular leukomalacia, but in my opinion, are um, pseudocysts of a germinal matrix. And Linda was very kind and <laughs> smiling and say, I totally agree. And in fact, in one month, a paper will appear on Acta Pediatrica uh, showing exactly the same findings. So uh, it is a pleasure for me to uh, have her here as a speaker uh, Corrado mentioned we uh, we tried to help uh, WEMS to diffuse uh, knowledge on neonatal uh, neurology, and we were very proud of that. Uh, you saw the book that she has produced uh, coming in, in, in the slide. Uh, she didn't know we were presenting that uh, because we, we think that she produced many books, but this book is really giving you the total entire sense uh, of our job. That means understanding disease, love for neuroimaging in guiding then how to understand the mechanism of the diseases and also cooperating with other professionals to improve the outcome of these babies. If I'm not wrong, the other author is a friend of Linda, a physiotherapist, in order to help the life of these uh, unlucky babies. And we will hear uh, the long-term outcome of uh, what we still call hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy, uh, that is still an area such as the, the subject of yesterday on stroke, uh, an area where we need to improve to understand uh, things and, and how to uh, help these babies uh, for the rest of their life. Sorry, a bit, I've been a bit too long, I know, uh, but uh, I feel I uh, couldn't avoid to speak in that way of Linda De Vries. Linda, it's your time. <clears throat> well, thank you very much, uh, Luca. That was a very kind and funny introduction. I remember that very clearly as well. It was beautiful in Assisi. And also a thanks again to Professor Moretti for allowing us to organize together this module on neonatal neurology, which has been really fun to be able to do it together. And today I was asked to talk about long-term outcomes of infants with HIE. And as you can see, there were many colleagues involved in doing these uh, studies. So I would like to start with this little girl and I will come back to her at the very end of my talk. And this baby was born well before hypothermia was possible in 1993, so almost also 30 years ago. And she was born following a sentinel event by a uterus rupture. She needed an emergency C-section, a very low umbilical pH, very poor APGAR scores and a not very high lactate actually of 12. 
We performed an AEG and you can see here that it is almost flat when she was put on the AEG within the first couple of hours. But fortunately, she recovered very quickly. And by the end of the first day, she was already showing some sleep-wake cycling, as you can see over here. In those days, we also performed evoke potentials. And we can see that even on the first day, she had very good looking somatosensory and visual evoke potentials. So we were rather positive about the expected outcome. And when the mom came back to the follow-up clinic at 18 months of age, she said, look, here's my miracle baby. And she was doing very well. She was walking, had no signs of disability. And on the Griffiths test, she had a developmental quotient of 95. So well within the normal range. So that was what happened in those days. We did follow up if we did any at all uh, in these children with perinatal problems, and then we would discharge them at 12 to 18 months of age if they didn't show any signs of cerebral palsy or any severe global delay. And we were not going to see them back anymore in uh, later ages, like at school. However, over the years, we understood from the parents that these children did develop issues when they grow into their deficits. And we started to see them for longer beyond the first couple of years. So let's start with imaging. These are the two main patterns of imaging that we can see in these children if they have any injury. So on the left, we see the kind of classical acute near total asphyxia, which is usually seen after a sentinel event like the uterus rupture I just talked about. And we see that these children need resuscitation in the delivery room. So they immediately meet the criteria for cooling. Cooling is given. And then if they don't do well, we can see this within the first 18 months and they may develop dyskinetic or uh, spastic uh, cordyplegia. On the right, we see a pattern which is called partial subacute asphyxia. And here, retrospectively, the mom quite often tells us that there were less fetal movements the last couple of days. But actually, the labor itself is often normal or only mildly complicated. The child recovers quickly and there's no delivery room resuscitation and the children therefore often do not meet the criteria for cooling. However, they tend to develop seizures within the first 24 hours, uh, but then they do well and the first couple of years like our little girl was doing well and uh, the outcome doesn't become really clear till they reach school age. So how do we image these children? Well, MRI is the preferred neuroimaging techniques to kind of identify these two types of injury. There are many kind of um, techniques to score the MRI. And I think it's most important that you use the one that you feel comfortable with. And we ourselves developed together with Lauren Weke, the Weke score in 2018. And the score kind of looks at all the little details where some of the other scoring systems didn't uh, look at. For instance, what is the signal in the cerebellum? Are there any punctate lesions? Is there an associated IVH? Do we see a sign of venous thrombosis? So this is all kind of taken into account. And especially these milder things may be seen more often in children with mild HIE. And therefore we can score these children with mild HIE better using this scoring system. If we looked at the short and long-term outcome at two years and early school age, six to seven years, and found that the area under the curve here shown for the gray matter abnormalities was very, very high above 0.9. And this still held true at the school age at six to seven years. So we like to use this uh, scoring system. It's really important that you are aware when best to perform the MRI. Here we see an example that we have seen over the years, and there are many like this, where if you perform your MRI very early on day two, you see low signal on the ADC map on the telemi. But if you repeat the MRI a couple of days later here on day five, then we can see that now the basal ganglia are also involved. And you actually see it more clearly on the diffusion weighted image. 
So the best time in our idea is to perform an MRI at the end of the first week and best after rewarming on day four to six, because then you still have the benefits from the diffusion weight imaging. And you also have the kind of full extent of the injury, which you do not have on the second or first day after birth. And this is another example. And this baby was uh, scanned on day four as well. And we see here that diffusion is really very helpful. There are extensive areas injury in the telomere here also in the optic radiation. And then if you continue to look at the child and repeat the MRI at three months, then we now see that there is not much to be seen in the telomere. They're also not really atrophic, but we do see scarring in the basal ganglia. So probably if we would have repeated this MRI a few days later, then the diffusion abnormalities would also have been seen in the basal ganglia. And this child developed a kind of very severe uh, spastic cordyplegia. Here we see another baby and now a little boy. And we see that the diffusion abnormalities are again very helpful to see this pattern of injury in the ventrolateral telomere and in the lentiform nuclei, which is very, very typical. But if you are seeing an MRI of a child like this later on, you have to be very careful not to miss the abnormalities. And these are then best seen with the so-called flare sequence, which is fluid attenuated inverse recovery, which shows the scarring, the gliosis here in the basal ganglia very clearly. And we also can see that there's quite a bit of atrophy of both the telomere as well as the basal ganglia. And on the T1, we also see a little bit of low signal in the lentiform nuclei. Now, you already saw the title of this book, and this boy was also in the book. And I'll show you a few video clips of the little boy. We see that he tries very best at two years on the Bailey kind of toys to perform this task. Of course, not aimed for a child with cerebral palsy, but he's always been very keen in spite of his handicap to achieve it and perform it. And as you can see over here, at this age, he was also able to move forward, but of course, it's not a normal kind of crawling. It's more like hopping. And if we look at the next video at three years, then again, he tries very much his best to perform the puzzle, um, but his hand manipulation is difficult due to his dyskinetic cerebral palsy that he developed. And you can also see that he's drooling quite a lot by then. But he's able to take a few steps using a posterior relator. And every time we filmed him, you can see that he's got this very eager kind of eyes and uh, he's very keen to do the things. And then finally, when he was with us at the age of five years, he is trying his very best to put the coins into the box. And uh, here you very clearly show that he has got difficulties with fine motor tasks and the typical dyskinetic type of cerebral palsy and hand movements. And then finally, we can see that he's now walking without his posterior rollator for short distances. And he also does his very best to kick a ball. And you see his dyskinetic gait very clearly. So together with Francis Cowan, Martinez Bjarge and Miriam did a very elegant study in 2011. And they looked in the second week, not the first week of life, with the MRI at a large group of over 170 children with HIE. And they looked specifically at myelination in the posterior limb of the internal capsule. And you can see on the left, it's normal. In the middle, it's what they called equivocal. And on the right, there is an inverted signal of the myelination of the posterior limb. And an abnormal posterior limb myelination predicted the inability to walk independently by two years with a very high sensitivity and a rather good specificity as well. Even more important, I think, is the paper they did in 2010 in early human development. And I really think this is a very, very important paper. It was done in normal thermic children. So the results may be slightly better in the, in the hypothermic infants, which they are working now at present. And it's really good to have this 
with you when you counsel parents, because it's not only about cerebral palsy, it's important and parents will always ask you, will my child be able to walk? But of course, there are many other domains that also need to be taken into account, like feeding and ability to talk, vision, developmental quotient, and the onset of seizures postnatally. And all these things can be found in these flow diagrams which are there for mild, moderate, and severe basal ganglia thalamic injury. So let's move to the subacute partial asphyxia, the watershed type of injury, the boundary zones that are affected. And once again, you will agree with me that the diffusion weighted imaging is the easiest way to look at this pattern of injury. On the T2, there is some high signal in the white matter, but you really see the abnormalities more clearly on the diffusion. And usually in these children, there's also involvement of the corpus callosum, as you can see here in the splenium. You can see these abnormalities also with ultrasound, but it's not as easy and you need high quality ultrasound. But if you look carefully, there is this echogenicity more pronounced on the right, like you also see on the T2 sequence. And there is this abnormal fuzzy looking sulcus, which you can also see here on the diffusion weighted imaging. However, <clears throat> MRI as always is kind of easier. And uh, if you then repeat the MRI at three months of age, it's very difficult to see any abnormalities which were so clearly seen on the neonatal scan. But there is some kind of effacement of the cortical surface. And there's also some atrophy here at the front. And then at seven years of age, then we do see that there is some scarring in the posterior lobes as we see on the flare sequence once again. So some neonatal seizures, but a good outcome up till the age of five years at least with a total IQ of 97 and a good movement ABC as well. Here we see another child who was less lucky he was admitted uh, also with seizures just after the hypothermic window. And we already had quite a lot of echogenicity on the first ultrasound. And if you see this, then you have to really consider the antenatal onset because the echogenicity takes at least 12 to 24 hours to develop. We performed two MRIs during the first week. And especially on the second MRI, we see the loss of the cortical ribbon a very high signal intensity in the white matter and on the diffusion, also high signal uh, diffusion restriction in the corpus callosum. The child was then seen again at three months of age and unfortunately developed cystic lesions in the frontal lobes, which were quite extensive and led to severe atrophy of the frontal lobes, as you can see. We repeated the MRI at the age of uh, seven years once again, and now we can see the sequelae. There is a lot of injury to the uh, watershed areas, especially here again in the frontal lobes, and more so on the left, with even a cyst still persisting. And we can see over here that over time, his uh, disabilities became more clear, and this was really due to his behavioral problems. So if you look at a few video clips of this little boy, then at 24 months, he was doing a puzzle and he looks very sweet, very nice boy. And he never had any motor issues. He was always very good in playing with the ball, which he liked very much. And we can see that here, he was already at two years able to kick the ball when he was running. And when we look at him again at the age of three years, he has become uh, left-handed. Uh, he's able to stack the uh, toys, the blocks, and he is still able to do that at the age of four years. And now he's doing it mainly with his left hand and he does this very fast, but his concentration span becomes more and more limited over time. And the last video clip is at seven years when we ask him to do it on the right. And he tries to kind of bring his left hand in because that's easier for him. So again, he does his very best, but unfortunately wasn't performing very well anymore on the uh, whipsy. Here we see that he can manage standing on one leg. 
and uh, he's also able to hop and uh, so never any motor disabilities and that's what we see these children have no injury to the basal ganglia and telomere, and therefore do not seem to be having any motor issues but cognitive problems occur over time so what happens over time if you repeat the mri well the mri again in the watershed type of injury another child at three months there's kind of effacement and some atrophy but the scarring takes time to develop and at 16 months, it starts to be recognized. And here at 10 years on a flare sequence, we see this very clearly and being so kind of localized in the occipital area, it's not surprising that she was especially disabled by her cerebral visual impairment and some cognitive delay as well. So on late imaging, we call this the watershed, the mushroom appearance. So we see the stalk and then this kind of head of the mushroom as we can recognize it here. And here also a flare sequence of the scarring. So again, Francis Cowan and Miriam martinez Biarge looked at this at the age of two years and children without basal ganglia telemic injury. And you can see for the children and normal or mild or moderate white matter injury, we do not see any cerebral palsy. Uh, we still see the DQ being within the normal range, but once it becomes severe, like two examples over here, now we see that the scores really drop and are significantly different and worse. Other patterns of injury that we can recognize are these so-called punctate white matter lesions, and we reported this with Heyman some years ago in 42 babies, and the major clinical association was perinatal asphyxia in almost half of these cases, but please bear in mind if there's not a clear history of HIE, then consider an underlying genetic disorder, which was present in 26 of these 42 cases. Here we see what happens over time with these punctate white matter lesions. So you see them very clearly. This is the ADC map where you especially clearly see them, but also on the T1. But at three months, we do not see them at all. We just see some irregular ventricular dilatation. But at six years now, we see them in exactly the same site as we saw them before. So just to bring home to you that at three months, it's difficult to see white matter injury. Uh, Cliosis needs time to develop uh, and it depends on the water content of the brain tissue. So it becomes visible in the second year of life. Well, let's move to kind of longer outcome as well. Here we see the two papers that were very important in 2004 and 2014 by the task force to talk about infants with severe IHE related neonatal encephalopathy. And in 2004, they said that these children are expected to develop cerebral palsy, either dyskinetic or spastic cordyplegia. But they changed their tune in 2014, and now they said that these children may have also other sequelae without cerebral palsy. And this was already reported by a very nice review paper by Stephen Miller and Fernando Gonzalez in 2006. And they mentioned in this paper that cognitive deficits are possible to be there in the absence of functional motor deficits and especially in children with the watershed predominant pattern of brain injury. And this, I think, is really very important to realize that you are not always having cerebral palsy if you have late sequelae. So what about the short-term outcome? Well, again, basal ganglia telemic injury, a high risk of cerebral palsy, the milder dyskinetic, the more severe polyplegia, but also an increased risk in many other domains. And the outcome becomes clear at an early age. In the wider matter watershed type of injury, the risk of CP is not so high. And if it's there, it's usually mild but there may be cognitive impairment, behavioral problems, memory problems, seizures, and these will only become clear at school age. So what about these long-term outcomes in HIE in the absence of major disabilities? 
I think this for me was an eye opener. This was published in Developmental Medicine and Child Neurology in 2015. And they looked at the cerebral palsy and intellectual disability and epilepsy and visual impairment. And they said that all these affect employment process in adulthood. But overall, 29% of adults between 21 and 35 years with these disabilities are employed and only 12% of cases with quadriplegia. And even more interesting, I think, is that children with a DQ between 55 and 85 are 22 times less likely to be employed than those with a DQ above 85. And we can see that here. If you look at the total costs, they are most prominent for those with disabilities, intellectual disabilities. So there were a lot of studies performed already in the 90s and the first decade of this century, looking at long-term outcome. And these were all children who were not called. And a landmark paper was done by Charlene Robertson in 1989, who for the first time looked at children at the age of eight years, very important. And then followed by Neil Marlowe, uh, two papers from Utrecht, David Ott from Bristol and Pires from the group of BLA Tal. So lots of data about long-term outcome. Here we see the first paper by Charlene Robertson in 1989. And it was here again an eye-opener that if you had moderate encephalopathy, but you were not impaired, then your tests at school were significantly different, both from your peer group, but also some from your mild non-impaired uh, uh, children. So very important information in this paper. Then a cohort study by David Ott in Bristol in the Lancet in 2009, the so-called AVEN longitudinal study. They looked at the huge number of children who have uh, resuscitation at birth, but ma majority recovered very quickly and remained asymptomatic, but some developed symptoms of encephalopathy. And the ones that developed these symptoms were doing significantly worse for performance and also with their full-scale IQ. They then looked in the year after at their neuropsychological functioning and educational attainment at school age. And here we see that for memory, the working memory was significantly worse for those who became symptomatic. And if you look at language, then the encephalopathic children have less good accuracy and also the comprehension was significantly worse. If you look at the group from Zurich, from Beelatal, then we see that children who sustained neonatal HIE without major disability were at increased risk for long-term intellectual, verbal and motor deficits. And the severity of the watershed injury, according to the Barkowitz score, was correlated with later intellectual performance. And we can see that here. And this is the total IQ at the age of 11 years. And we also see significant effect on the Zurich Neuromotor Assessment Score. This is from the group in uh, Cork. Deirdre Murray as the first author, looking at 53 infants, and this paper was about the early EEG grade, and looking at mild NE and also the moderate and severe NE. And here they found that both the mild and moderate NE children had a significantly lower uh, full-scale IQ at the age of five years. And interestingly, there was no difference in cognitive measures between the mild and moderate grades of HIE. We did a very similar study in 2010, looking with serial MRIs in children who were then nine to 10 years of age. There were 80 altogether. 34 with mild ME and 46 with moderate ME, including some children with mild cerebral palsy. And we can see here there are also significant differences already for the mild group and uh, the children without cerebral palsy, but the moderate ME were performing worse and those with cerebral palsy were the worst affected, most affected group. 
So here we see an example on the right from the neonatal MRI to the childhood MRI. And you see that the pattern of injury here, the watershed type of injury is the same. And we now at 10 years see the gliosis in the boundary zones. But here it's interesting that if at 10 years of age you have a normal or a mildly abnormal MRI, then still almost half of the children had an abnormal total impairment score on the movement ABC. And an IQ below 86 was seen in almost 22% of the children. So that is really worrying. And of course, it's 100% and 71% if you have moderate to severe lesions. But those with only mild lesions also had a lot of problems. So we also looked at their um, concentration and behavior. And here we see a paper from 2009, the teacher report form. And we saw that there was a trend between the controls, the mild and the moderate and equal. And you see that they were more anxious and depressed, had more attention and social problems, internalizing problems, and total problems. And this was most severe in the moderate and E group. We also looked in detail at their memory function. And again, we saw this trend from cerebral palsy being the worst to controls being, of course, the best, but also a discrepancy between mild and moderate and E. And this is the very complex figure where they have to kind of uh, repeat this very complex drawing first when they still see it and then subsequently also by heart. Kim Anek, one of our PhD students, looked at these children once again and now looked at the volume of the hippocampi. And we see, as we probably would expect, that the more severe the NE, the smaller the hippocampal volume and also a significant relation between the total hippocampal volume and the full-scale IQ at the age of 9 to 10 years. Others also looked at memory problems in children with perinatal asphyxia, and this is another paper from the group in Barcelona looking in adolescence and also finding that the children were significantly having more memory problems compared to the controls. Well, let's move to the hypothermia. Uh, maybe you didn't know, I didn't know either till recently that Chagall was born when his mother was 16 as the first of eight siblings. And he drew his birth in uh, 1922. And he was born in 1887. And as you can see here, he was put into ice cold water because it didn't breathe at birth. And you can wonder whether his very interesting blue colors comes from some degree of perinatal asphyxia. But I really love his paintings. So what has changed since the introduction of hypothermia? Well, if you look at the meta-analysis from 2012, then you see that every outcome at 18 months is in favor of hypothermia, except for deafness, which was not improved with hypothermia itself. Neil Marlowe had a very nice review last year. And here there was a comparison of the NICHD study and the Toby study. And we can see that they're different and the outcomes are better for the Toby study. But in the practice point, he says that despite hypothermia, a high proportion of survivors still develop moderate to severe disability, necessitating close follow-up into childhood. Here we see them next to each other, and we can see obviously that in dark blue, the children in the Toby trial were doing better uh, than in the children with the NICHD. And uh, that I think is interesting by itself. And the Toby trial was performed a little bit later. Then in a review paper by Papas in Pediatrics in 2015 about this NICHD trial group, as there was no significant difference between the controls and the hypothermic children, they put them together and they said that 96% of the survivors with cerebral palsy had an IQ below 70 on the Bailey 2, but also 9% of the children without cerebral palsy had an IQ less than 70, and almost a third had an IQ of 70 to 84, and that is at the age of six to seven. 
So they concluded that survivors of neonatal encephalopathy with and without cerebral palsy are at elevated risk for subnormal IQ and the need for specialized educational services. And then Bristol had a few very interesting papers. They were really the first to look into this. And the first paper came out in 2018, looking at 29 cases and 20 age-matched, sex-matched, and social class-matched term-born controls. And you can see that for the WISC, and as well as for the movement ABC, the cooled babies did not do so well compared to the controls. So they had significantly lower cognitive scores, on average 14 IQ points lower, and they had tenfold increased odds of requiring additional support at school. And here we see the results in the table. So you can see almost 14 point difference for the full scale IQ. But here, for instance, if you look at the full scale IQ less than 85, then we also see that it's significantly more common, 50% in the children who were having hypothermia. They then went on to do the next paper, uh, looking for attention and visuospatial functioning. And here again, the cases were performing significantly worse compared to the controls. They then had some very elegant imaging work with Arthur Spencer as the first author, and this was published last year, 33 cases now and 36 controls. And with the Foxelweiss analysis, they found that reduced fractional anisotropy in widespread areas of white matter in cases, and this was particularly seen in the fornix, the corpus callosum, the internal capsule, and the cingulum. And here we see the connectograms, and we can see that there is a significant difference between the cases and controls for the mean network fractional anisotropy, and we also see that there is a significant relation between the mean network FA and the full-scale IQ, and they did a similar paper also on motor outcome. They then also looked at brain volumes in these children, and the patients had lower volumes of the whole brain, the gray matter, the white matter, the globus pallidi, the hippocampi, and telomere compared to the controls. And the hippocampal and telemic volumes correlated with total IQ and also with the movement ABC total score independent of age, sex, and total brain volume. This is another group from Italy. It's every actually several centers. The data pooled of 40 babies assessed at six years. And they also found differences for intelligent, visual motor skills, executive function, and attention. And interestingly, the incidence of psychopathology was higher in children with HIE, 35% compared to 12% in the control peers. There have been many, many papers since then, and these are just a few of them that I think you might find interesting as well, and they all come up with the same result that the children who were cooled are different from the controls. And this was also found in a paper looking at mild NE survivors. And here is a paper about a motor outcome, also interesting, published last year. Small group of 27 babies, and they found that the MND was more prevalent, the movement performance was worse, and the inattention scores were higher in the cool babies, uh, but the Bailey scores at two years did not correlate with the movement AB2 scores later on at six years. So then I would like to finish with the mammillary bodies. And this is really thanks to Martin Lecrain. He is our pediatric radiologist who at some stage told us that we should look at the mammillary bodies. And they are part of the so-called PAPES system, and they are related to the hippocampal formation and also to the anterior telemic nuclei. And we know that the mammillary bodies are important for memory, short-term memory. And the abnormal mammillary bodies was actually present in 40% of the cooled babies who we assessed in Leiden, Genova, and Utrecht, so almost half of them. 
And we know a little bit about mammillary bodies from med school when we learned about the Wernicke Korsakoff syndrome. And this was based on thiamine deficiency. So when you drink too much and it's still reversible, it's the deficiency in thiamine which is restored in the Wernicke encephalopathy. But if you continue to drink more and more and it's not treated, you will develop the Korsakoff syndrome. This is a paper from Israel where they had uh, six babies who were between two and 10 months with encephalopathy, who had been fed with solely soy based formula, which was devoid of thiamine from birth. And they recognized this problem looking at the mammillary bodies, which you see over here being abnormal. And of course, there are other abnormalities in the basal ganglia, but this for them was a marker that they should search for thiamine deficiency. But apparently, HIE is also a risk factor for abnormalities in the mammillary bodies. And it feels like this selective attention test that probably you've all been asked to watch. There are two players, teams, the black and the white team, and you have to count the number of bouncing balls for one of the two teams. And when you're focused on doing this, you will miss the gorilla, which is walking right through the group. And this felt for me a little bit like the story of the mammillary bodies. I never really looked at them. And they are quite small. You can see them here just above the cerebral peduncles. The signal is more or less the same as the surrounding tissue. And you can only see them when you use two millimeter slices on your sequences, your T2 sequence, when you see them best. So what do they look like when they're abnormal? Well, they're very strikingly abnormal. They're swollen. The signal is increased. And here we see the diffusion where they're also shown. And here in combination with the hippocampi, which is quite often the case. And if you then look at them again a couple of months later, they're gone. We see that they've become completely atrophied. And here on the stalk where you should see them, you don't see anything at all. And here again, Kim Onik did some very nice research looking at the mammillary bodies at school age in our population of cooled and non-cooled babies. And we can see here that they're very often uh, related to also the reduced hippocampal volume. Uh, and they were associated with the IQ, the performance IQ, processing speeds, and especially also episodic memory. And here in the table, we can see that the children with the abnormal mammillary bodies, a small group still, have significantly worse intelligence tests and a lot of abnormal memory tests as well, significantly different from those with normal mammillary bodies. And here we can see the TBSS on the left side and on the right side, we see the graph. And there we can see the children with normal mammillary bodies at higher white matter FA values compared to children with mammillary body atrophy over here. And here we can see that the larger hippocampal volumes corrected for age and sex had a widespread positive association with the FA values throughout the brain. And together with the group of Bristol, we looked at their population, looked at the mammillary bodies, and again found that they had abnormalities in 34% and compared to none in their controls. And this, again, was related to lower processing speed, lower full-scale IQ, and lower scores in all cognitive domains. So it was nice to confirm it. And furthermore, they were able to perform this connectivity looking at the mammillothalamic tract. And here we can see the results. We can see here the cases with abnormal mammillary bodies, and they have smaller hippocampal volumes as well compared to the controls. And we can also see that the uh, radial diffusivity, the RD, are increased in the children with abnormal mammillary bodies. So all very, very interesting. So let's get back to our miracle baby. What happened to her? 
but it didn't remain a miracle, unfortunately. By the time she was eight years old, mom started to ring me and tell me that she had a very poor short-term memory. She would go up the stairs to collect the toy, and then by the time she got up there, she had forgotten all about her toy and didn't know why she had run up the stairs. We did an MRI at the age of 11 years, and here we can see it, and we thought this MRI looked really good. The ventricles are normal in size, the myelination looked normal, we didn't see any gliosis anywhere. So we were a little bit stuck. But then when we learned about the mammillary bodies, we went back to her MRI once again. And now we were missing the mammillary bodies that we could clearly see here all together. And we see this empty stalk. So we tried to get in touch with her. And at the age of 29 years of age, she told me that she is now living on her own with a lot of help from her parents. And this is going very well, fortunately but she kept on telling me about her memory problems. And she says, there are often things that I run into when it comes to my memory. A few years ago, I was unable to complete my level three care training because it was all too much, too many tests, too much memorization, and I couldn't do it. She's now working as a certified helper in a home for the elderly, where she says that I feel accepted and get help when necessary. So this woman has failed every possible exam because of being unable to memorize. So to conclude, hypothermia has improved outcome without moderate to severe disability and also reduced deaths. Um, despite therapeutic hypothermia for NE, however, we still see cognitive, behavioral and memory problems and these continue to occur. And the mammillary bodies may be an additional part of this puzzle. And I think this is a very interesting field to further research. And as I understand, you probably understood by now, long-term follow-up is needed in these children as cognitive, behavioral, and memory problems only become evident at school age. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Linda. Wonderful talk, really, really, really nice in the way it has been also updated, you know, in terms of uh, what we knew up to 20 years ago, what we are trying to understand better and the improvement uh, we are observing and understanding how severe is asphyxia even without uh, uh, the proper uh, dramatic lesion in the basal ganglion telomere. Uh, so I think this is a great step for the quality of uh, uh, our medicine, how to afford uh, this difficult disease. Uh, I really liked also the way you mentioned uh, uh, at the beginning, the sentinel events, uh, and and asphyxiated babies without sentinel events. And I think uh, we probably will need a registry in Europe because uh, we have differences inside Europe. Uh, we have even more differences between Europe and US in the way of uh, observing which kind of lesion are suffering these babies uh, born with a, a hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy. So I really, think it is a wonderful uh, presentation. And as well, as I mentioned before, you know, being a professor of neonatal neurology, uh, it means also to go back. Uh, and the way you mentioned uh, uh, how to follow this uh, woman now, you know, with her memory problems that couldn't really do a successful professional life because of uh, of the memories is really uh, very sad, you know, in a sense, and also because we probably at the beginning we were very encouraging with her because the, she didn't have a serious uh, lesion for what we understood. And uh, so uh, I, I feel a bit, how to say, uh, with the shivers about this story of this uh, young uh, woman, you following so nicely up to when she's practically 30 years. So now reading, uh, I promise I'm not going to, to, to cry. 
<laughs> but but uh, it's not guaranteed. Uh, <laughs> you know, it, it's this memory can have such an enormous impact on your life. And I've been talking to a few more of these women now and women so far, and uh, they seem to be having kind of similar problems as this uh, woman I talked about. Yeah, and, and, and because we practically introduce the range of things that are happening, you know, uh, with asphyxia from the most severe forms with the lesions, but we have to move on uh, uh, on different kind of. Uh, before I read all the all the all the questions, because to honor the 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 people that are uh, following, uh, such as we we are uh, on five hundred people, so we're very happy. Uh, from any part of the world. Uh, let me ask you something. Uh, I remember a paper uh, and I, because I had this feeling that uh, we may see more uh, white matter lesions after the introduction of uh, hypothermia, especially in the lowest gestational age allowed to be cooled. I'm speaking about uh, 35 weaker, and someone, I'm not happy to cool the 34 weaker. Uh, and so I'm asking you, because I have that worry that uh, we have to be a bit more cautious on the use of, uh, because I mean, uh, neonatologists are always very keen to enthusiastic to, to use um, uh, hypothermia when we have uh, understood something is useful, but I can't be a panacea. Uh, so what's your feeling about that kind of gestational age group in terms of uh, uh, allowing them to undergo uh, hypothermia? This is my question. In the meanwhile, I read all the others. Yeah, I think there, there's still a randomized control trial for this kind of late preterm 34 to 36 weeks underway. And I think we have to kind of wait for the results before we change our policy. Um, sometimes 35 weeks, yes, but not below 35 weeks. So you got the same feeling. Uh, same person from yesterday, Bharat Vakarakya, do you suggest we should wait until 10-14 uh, days uh, to MRI, practically the baby, uh, to look at plaque myelination? Um, no, I don't think so. I think we should make our lives easy and, and benefit from the diffusion weighted imaging during the first week. Uh, so then you will see the abnormalities in the basal ganglia. You don't, it now it's not really necessary anymore to look at myelination in the plic. You, you can still do when you kind of do it in the second week, but obviously in a 35 weeker that would not be helpful. Uh, but to kind of avoid the issue of non-myelinated posterior limb, then I think I, I would recommend to do it during the first week and look for diffusion abnormalities, which are really easy to recognize. And why we miss. Can practice can, can general movements from Dr. Shireen Nader uh, can be sensitive as MRI in the first month of life, uh, in, I guess, for, uh, to predict prognosis? Yeah, there has not been a lot of data as far as I'm aware about the use of general movements in HIE. There has been some, um, and I think it definitely can also be used. Whether it's as good as the MRI, I, I'm not aware that ha that has been compared. Do you know, Luca? Yeah. Sorry? Do you know of any data that had done a straight comparison between MRI? No, I mean, you know, I mean, uh, Fabrizio Ferrari is always very fond uh, because he's one of the uh, hero uh, from Pract directly, you know? Uh, mm -hmm. But I, I don't think, I, honestly, to be honest, I mean, it's, it's a very time consuming technique uh, and we can't avoid to, with that one to perform an MRI. So it, it may add something. Uh, but uh, I have no suggestion in that sense as well. No, and you would have to wait anyway till the child is off morphine. And no, yeah, no, yeah. Drugs anymore. Uh, they're asking you, Andrea Praptonic, uh, which scale do you use uh, for development, development? 18 months, you showed already. Um, I don't understand this one. Do you recommend rep reputable or performing a brain MRI for any child? with the history of perinatal asphyxia. 
definitely all the children who are being cooled will get an MRI, I think in most centers. And I think any child who has had seizures should also have an MRI because then you will find abnormalities to explain your seizures in more than 90%. Yeah. Someone is, is simply say, great talk, simply that, uh, Abdullah. Uh, Anything that you're trying to improve the outcome uh, of these babies behind the three years. So according, I don't know, uh, with the with the, the things you, you described so nicely in some of the cognitive skills. Um, no, not yet. We, we've just been kind of testing them and, and referred them for help. Um, but I think there now starts to be kind of more specific help for memory problems. Uh, also, when the children are still not going to school, and uh, they were just starting in the children's hospital, Wilhelmina Children's Hospital, doing this kind of as a trial. And of course, if you know that they're going to have memory problems early, which is difficult to diagnose early on, then you may be able to kind of help them early on as well. And of course, that would be great. That's what we all want to do, try and prevent them from getting worse. Yeah. Uh, thanks. There is someone you may know, we may, or we may know, uh, called ANMT. Uh, practically, is Marianne Torreson. Uh, <laughs> she, she's asking in a cohort. Uh, we we say hello to Marianne. You know, she's done such a lot of things on this on this area. In a cohort of different ages, say five, fifteen years. How can one? best test them at different ages and compare? Well, well I think nowadays people are, are still using the, the WIPSI and I think now it's the WIPSI 4 when the children are between are around five, six years and then they go on to the WISC. Um, but at the age of 15 years, I'm, I'm not certain. I think the, the WISC or the Wexter is still being, being used and the NEPSI is also being used at a kind of older age. Right. We want to compare them across different centers. I think it's very important that we use the same tests. And of course, one of the problems is also, which is kind of normal, we are becoming smarter and smarter, so they say. Uh, so we need to kind of update the test every time. So you start use, looking at the cohort with the Bailey 2, and then all of a sudden becomes the Bailey 3, and <laughs> to compare them. And that happens now to the, the WIPSI and the, and the WISC, of course, as well. Yeah, you tested uh, 29 years so as well. So uh, at what age, well, that's easy question. Can we detect mammillary body abnormalities on MRI? Well, if they're really swollen and abnormal, then we see that on the first MRI, if you don't have an early MRI, but you're doing an MRI in three months, of course, then you will kind of realize that they're no longer there. So they've become atrophic, but it's, Kind of I, I, I make a comment about this question because I liked it a lot, because it's giving us a sort of uh, feeling of the atmosphere we may be able to create, create, you know, because of generate, because we are in different parts of the world and we practically, we feel like at home speaking with someone of this, uh, how to say, uh, highly, highly reputation. And so, so Pusta Orukova, Dr. Pusta Orukova, She's asking you, thank you for great presentation. Okay. And she's asking you, what is your experience? And because we're friends now via Zoom or Teams, or even thoughts about allopurinol and melatonin. So how much, uh, what are your feeling about? So this is a difficult question for you coming from the, a place where you invested a lot, at least on allopurinol at some point. Well, the allopurinol trial is, is ongoing in Europe and Utrecht is part of it. And I see that uh, Nikki is online and I'm happy to refer to her because she's going to talk about this tomorrow in her talk on edge Yeah. yeah. Uh, melatonin for Nikki too tomorrow. Yeah, yeah she definitely okay. will discuss that. Yeah. Uh, well, this is a tricky a question. I'm sure you have a, a proper answer. Uh, can we rec recognize mammillary bodies by performing ultrasound? No, no with Silke Stegeda, we've tried it in Leiden, but it's, uh, it's really, really difficult to see them. They're so tiny. 
And sometimes we think they might be there, they might be swollen, but I don't think it's going to be reliable. Really needs an MRI to see them. Right. And after we have uh, this interesting question too, I mean, there is any idea that maybe mammillary, if we see mammillary body abnormalities later in life, no, uh, maybe for some other reason that we do see mammillary body, maybe to uh, about memory issues, uh, not only with the evidence of HIE. Yeah, <clears throat> well, that's definitely a very interesting question. Yeah. We reviewed the literature and actually reviewed our data as well. And we've seen it in a child with current actress. Uh, we've seen it in a child with GBS meningitis. So it's not only the kind of perinatal asphyxia that kind of helps you that there might be a hypoxic event, but it can also be seen in, for instance, we've seen it in a child with stroke. So it's not only the HIE group. And actually Martin Lequin is now looking at a cardiac uh, after cardiac surgery, um, neonatal cardiac surgery, and there it's very common as well. Gillian Fu, as a neonatologist on the other side of the world, our follow-up is usually locked uh, for funding at two years uh, uh, when they are fine on Bailey. Do, do you, would you recommend a follow-up milestone until five for these children with normal MRI? Uh, I think the the the, uh, uh, the the answer is easy for you. Yes, well, mm -hmm. I think so too. And as I showed you in my example, these children may be looking great, and uh, then they start to have problems when they grow into their deficits, as they like to say. So I I do think it's important. Yeah. Right. Uh, last two last two uh, avoiding question that can be postponed to tomorrow for Tuniki. Okay. Uh, about other neuroprotective strategies because the, the, the talk is focusing on that tomorrow. Uh, thank you again. This is interesting. Your opinion is this is going uh, in the sense of friendship uh, from any part of the world. Mohammed Abu Isef Badawi about the use of cooling for sudden postnatal collapse. Yeah. Um... We've, we've always done that in, in Utrecht and also in Leiden. I think you know very clearly when it happens and it's also kind of a real kind of hypoxic ischemic event. Um, and um, I, I just saw a couple of weeks ago a review paper about it, talking about a few cases themselves and reviewing the literature. And uh, so, and I'm sure I know that Mariana Torsen has been doing this as well. So I think, yes, we, we have been doing it and I think we should be doing it. Yeah, in those, uh, can I make a comment on that? Uh, it's also a way to go back to pathophysiology, no? more than a, a meta-analysis of data, because this is fitting very much on the, the proper work of hypothermia following the uh, reperfusion phase. Uh, so it's very convincing from that point of uh, view, but of course we need data to say yes, but we cooling those babies too, since quite a few years. Uh, this is uh, for the future, so I will leave with it, uh, something for the future. Do you think uh, from Lamia Sultanova, can we treat mammillary body with stem cells? Maybe it's a bit too yeah. soon, but say something. <laughs> we will find out in due course when people start using it for HIE. It will be yeah. interesting to see. Very, very, so many thanks. Uh, we really thanks so much for your time, for your great lecture. And uh, we'll leave uh, to Corrado Moretti and Ola, if he's still uh, around, I can see here on the computer. Yes, uh, Ola, Professor Ola Sogstad. Uh, and I leave it to, to all of you just to see the picture of the next meeting and Corrado will, uh, Moretti, Professor Corrado Moretti and Professor Sogstad will uh, close the meeting. Uh, Linda. I can just say that uh, that there was really impressive uh, lecture today, really impressive. So thank you very much for your, your fantastic work that you've done uh, in all the, the webinars. And uh, I start to suppose that perhaps a round table on MRI could be really useful. <laughs> so you have really good thing coming. And thank you very much what, for what you have done and for what you will do again.
Thank you. Yeah, thank, you Linda. thank you. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, Linda. Okay. This was a great, great lecture. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Bye.